Today we speak to Glynis Breitenbach, the Democratic Alliance's Shadow Minister of Justice. Welcome, Glynis. Hi, good morning. Thank you. So um, I was looking far into the future when I called you the Minister of Justice. <laughs> so let's take that giant leap. Unlikely. If, if you were the Minister of Justice, what yeah. would your priorities be right now? Well, my priorities right now would be to uh, make sure that we restore the functionality of the criminal justice system. Uh, the entire system needs a, a serious overhaul, uh, and that includes the police, the prosecution, the judiciary, and, and correctional services. So, you know, the Minister of Justice is a very big job, make no mistake. Uh, nobody should envy that job. It's a huge, huge job. It's a massive department with many responsibilities. So it's not an easy job, and that's why he has two deputies. Uh, but that being said, uh, the department has it's gone seriously backwards um, during the previous parliament, the fifth parliament, under, under Michael Masuta, and it's continued that slide under Ronald Lamola. He came into the job with you know, a lot of promise. He's a youngster. He's, uh, he's, a, he's a, an attorney. He's practiced as an attorney. Everyone, myself included, uh, believed that he was going to really make a difference. He's a very nice, affable guy. Uh, but, um, in fact, the department has deteriorated markedly uh, under his uh, stewardship and, uh, and the, the occurrences of the last sort of year have uh, made it very clear that he's just not up to the job. Okay. So, so what I would do is um, I would uh, make sure that the administration in the Department of Justice uh, upped its game. At the moment, we have the courts not sitting because the court machinery doesn't work, the recording machine doesn't work because the contract has expired and nothing is put in its place. So there's, and that's not the only example. There are there's terrible, uh, you know, contract management in the in within the Department of Justice that needs to be fixed. The way the budget is is spent uh, concerns me. Um, I, I don't always think that we get sufficient bang for our buck. So one would have to uh, revisit how the budget is spent. Um, there's a lot of dead wood in the department. Um, and, and there's very little skill retention in the department. Many people now, for instance, in the uh, legislative drafting unit are, are retiring and leaving. And that's a skill that's built up over 20 years. It's not a, a skill that you can learn in a day. And it's, a, it's a, a matter of deep concern to me that our ability to produce quality legislation uh, is going to diminish because there's, I don't see skills being retained. I don't see um, sufficient mentorship and I, I don't see anything you know, being brought up the ranks to, 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 uh, to complement uh, those people that are leaving. So th those skills that are lost are of, a, are of great concern. Um, the way uh, court interpreters are, are treated is a, a matter of grave concern. Uh, they're not treated professionally. There's very little training available for them. Um, they're expected to do a big job. A court interpreter is expected to walk into court every morning and interpret that which is placed before the court. So he's... You know, he, he, murder, rape, commercial matters, uh, motor vehicle theft, insurance matters, anything. They're expected to be able to deal with, with that, to have the kind of court vocabulary that can deal with it with no training. Uh, it's, it's an impossibility. And so many court hours are lost because of the unavailability of a skilled interpreter for that particular thing. Also foreign language interpreters and uh, particularly uh, South African Sign Language interpreters. So those things need to be addressed so that courts can sit. Courts at the moment are sitting for an hour and 10 minutes on average a day. Good uh, imagine you worked for an hour and 10 minutes a day, uh, how well you'd be doing. So, you know, courts should sit for between four and six hours a day. Uh, that, those court hours have got to go up. There's very little discipline. Uh, I would... I would uh, Infor I'm a, a great believer in discipline and, and I would enforce discipline. People must arrive at work on time and work until they leave, not sit about uh, doing nothing. So in the, in the National Prosecutor, while it's independent of, of the Department of Justice, the department is, uh, ha is in control of the budget of the NPA. Uh, operationally, they're independent, uh, but for many things they have to, they have to uh, consult with the minister. Uh, I would demand that the National Prosecuting Authority up its game. Um, the court hours, again, are, are, are terrible. There's, a, in my view, a lack of discipline. Uh, prosecutors need to be in court prosecuting, not uh, sitting about. 
So you know, th- those are the kinds of things that I would... Your priority. Yeah, and, and I'm not suggesting that all prosecutors come to work and sit about. Uh, there are many, many prosecutors who work really, really hard every single day in terrible conditions. I mean, if you just take a wanderer around this country and pop into a court, you'll see how they look. Some of them are shocking. The uh, facility, the public facilities, the toilet facilities are terrible. Uh, the, the, the floors are terrible. The wall, the lighting is falling apart. I mean... The, the courts are not properly maintained. That's an issue for public mm-hmm. works. Uh, but I don't see the Minister of Justice, the current Minister of Justice, taking on the Minister of Public Works to insist that their buildings are properly maintained. The court roof in Potterstrom the magistrate, just collapsed. Fortunately, no one was killed. But the roof just collapsed. While they, was While they were busy. And, and, and for, for months, the court sat on the pavement <laughs> under a tree in the 21st century in South Africa. Uh, so, you know, that type of thing needs to be attended. There's just, um, things are falling apart. Uh, the, the lift in the Supreme Court of Appeal in Bloemfontein hasn't worked for years uh, because the lift uh, well is filled with water and nobody does anything about it. Um, you know, the roof leaks. The, chief, the, the, the president of the Supreme Court of Appeal has run out of the bucket trying to catch the water. It's nonsense. It, you know, it, it's just, there's not enough attention to detail. There's no discipline. Oh. That's a grim picture. And truly, that... That's not a situation that can be turned around in a couple of years, is it? It can be turned around in a couple of years. If everybody does what they're supposed to do, it can be turned around. The Chief Justice, the President of the Supreme Court of Appeal is supposed to sit in court and not catch rain, water with a bucket. So it's, the roof must be repaired. And then, and then that will free her up to do what she's meant to do. Uh, the lift needs to get a, a pump into the stairwell so that when it when storm water runs in there, that it immediately pumps it out, then that will take care of that. Uh, if everybody does their job, it can be turned around in a very short space of time. Let's talk about the NPA. If you could instruct the M- NPA today, which cases would you like to see them prioritise? Which cases oh. would you like them to take to court? There's so many, first. But, but first but first off, uh, nobody should be able to instruct the NPA. So the NPA is independent and it must be so, and prosecutors, each prosecutor has an unfettered discretion, and it must be so. No, I understand that. So nobody could could instruct them. If there were cases that I would like to To see see prosecuted, Mm. uh, certainly I would like to see um, the state capture cases, the most egregious of them, prioritised. I'd like to see three or four in court right now, so that, uh, you know, the, the hunger that South Africans have for for accountability and consequences for antisocial behaviour uh, that you could start to 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 assuage that hunger, um, because people want to see accountability. People want to see consequences for bad behaviour, and we're not seeing it. And the only thing that will stop the kind of corruption that we have in South Africa now is if uh, people who are, uh, you know, committing that kind of corruption are sent to jail for significant periods of time. So I would like to see like the top four or five state capture cases in court. And, and being prosecuted successfully, not like the Free State one, that for some reason that uh, still baffles me, uh, was such a disaster. Uh, well, who knows uh, what happened there? Um, I would like to see um, a more responsive National Prosecuting Authority. So, so I, would like, uh, I would like to see, I would have liked to have seen, but it's going to be almost impossible now, some of the, um, you know, Eugene de Kock was prosecuted for apartheid era uh, offences, but he was the only one prosecuted. It almost feels like he was a scapegoat. Uh, he wasn't the only person. What, what he did is unforgivable, absolutely. Uh, but, but he wasn't the only person involved, uh, yet he was the only person prosecuted. There, there were many others who, who should be prosecuted. There were many other people higher up the food chain who should have been held accountable. Uh, most of them now have died. And so those families are being left uh, with no possibility of closure. Mm. And, and, and for them emotionally, that is, not, uh, you know, a cross they're going to have to bear forever. Not, not just, you know, the people who were involved at the time, but their children and their grandchildren. They're never going to find closure. There's always going to be that hole. Um, so I would like to have seen that done. How you would address that now, uh, one would have to consult very closely with the families. I'm not sure that that's happening. So I would like to see a, a better, uh, more responsive interaction uh, there. Um, and, and organized crime. I mean, organized crime, you read every day about a building mafia. Uh, you, you know, every, everything is controlled 
by some sort of mafia. Uh, South Africa used to prosecute organized crime very, very effectively. Uh, then, of course, the ANC uh, dissolved mm. the Scorpions overnight because they bit them and they didn't like it. Uh, and now they bleat on about the investigative director which will do the same job, but well, it won't. And and uh, and in any event, if they become tired of, of it, then they will dissolve it again like they did. Um, so organized crime, we have no crime intelligence in South Africa whatsoever. It doesn't exist. And uh, and that needs to be built up. So it's, it's, not a, it's not a single thing. You know, you need... The prosecutors are dependent on what the police bring to them as a docket. So the police need to be beefed up. The, the police are seriously depleted, both with regards to finances, finances and, and human resources. There's, you know, that needs to be dealt with. Um, the prosecuting aspect needs to be dealt with. More training, better training for judges needs to be dealt with. And then, of course, our prisons need to be bulldozed and redone because they're an abomination. Because people feel the TRC referred hundreds of cases... Yes. To the uh, NPA. Um, many names have come out of the Zondo Commission, mm. but people are very skeptical. Yes, well, people, you know, they've, 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 they have no reason to be optimistic because uh, for decades now nothing has happened. And what are the main reasons why that has not happened? You know, it's, it's difficult to say. Um, uh, when I was with the NPA, my, my area of speciality was white collar crime, I, I prosecuted commercial crime. Um, and, of course, there were always these rumours about deals being struck, about people mm. who wouldn't be... Pro I don't know if that's true. Um, I've not seen any evidence of it. Uh, uh, nobody's ever said directly to me that that was the case. Uh, and if, I, if it had been the case and I had been aware of it, and I'm quite sure other prosecutors too, if, they had, if that had been the case, they would not have accepted it. It's not in the nature of prosecutors to accept deals like that. Uh, prosecutors are, by their very nature, fiercely independent. And so... Um, I'm not sure if that's true. I, I would hope it isn't true. Um, it's difficult to prosecute those kinds of cases. People don't uh, really uh, like to take risks. They don't really want to give evidence in those types of matters. They don't want to put themselves out there. It's very hard to find admissible evidence that's credible. Um, and as time goes by, it gets harder to do. People die, evidence disappears. So it, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to address. Whistleblowers face a very difficult time in this country. They do. What would it involve for a whistleblower to go into a witness protection program? <sighs> yeah, you know, it's not... People, if, when people hear about a witness protection program, they think of, like, L.A. law. <laughs> and, you know, people who get a new face and go and live in Hawaii, that's just not how it happens in South Africa. Um, we don't have the resources for a, a comprehensive super effective witness protection program. And so the way it happens is really a, a very scale. We do have a witness protection program, and it is so that uh, I, I don't think uh, may, one, maybe two people have been killed on the program, uh, but it's not a regular occurrence, so the program in that sense is effective. Uh, but, but it's not pleasant. You, you give up your whole life. Um, if you have a family, if you have a wife, if you have children, they all have to give up their lives. Because you can't be living in, in a, a safe house somewhere uh, and have people coming and going. That's not possible. So, you know, your, your life effectively ends. And, and that's really very difficult. Uh, and most people don't last. So, so it's, not a, it's not a nice, comfortable program to be on. It's, it's difficult for everybody. And we don't have the resources to, to seriously vamp it up. Um, so I don't see our witness protection program now as a, as a solution to the problem. Um, I see the in inefficiency of of the, the various law enforcement bodies mm. as the problem, and beefing those up should solve that problem. But whistleblowers do need more protection, and um, we're busy working on, when I say we, I mean my, myself and my colleagues in the justice portfolio of the DA are, are working on a, a new whistleblowing bill, um, Brilliant. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting and difficult, and I, I'm not sure how much support we'll get because uh, it's counterintuitive in that it offers um, a financial reward for whistleblowing, but that needs a whole lot of safeguards built in so you don't get people uh, you know, making up stories just to get money. Uh, so there has to be a whole lot of steps that need to be followed and, and you know, it's a lot of checks and balances. 
Um, and also, I would like to build into it, uh, we'll be busy building into it, uh, a provision that uh, for investigative journalism bodies like perhaps, you know, uh, Amma Mungani, the Daily Maverick, th those publications with big investigative directorates, we, um, should they produce evidence that leads to a prosecution that uh, and money is, is uh, you know, gotten back by way of asset forfeiture, they should get a percentage of that. Because perennially those uh, bodies are under, underfunded and rely on donations and it's really, they work on a shoestring budget and they do unbelievable work. Uh, you know, during the run-up to the blowing out of state capture, they did all the work. And so um, we think they should, you know, it should be possible to reward that type of activity as well. So, so we, the, the checks and balances in the bill are difficult and, and we're mm. working on that. Yeah. Talking about bills. Talk to us about the Anti-Corruption Commission Bill, ah, your well, baby. The Anti-Corruption Commission Bill really is not, not, not my baby. It was, the, it was the product largely of um, uh, Accountability Now uh, and Paul Hoffman and, and his colleagues. Uh, and it took him a long time to convince me that it was a good thing uh, because I do believe that we, the National Prosecuting Authority should be the only prosecuting authority in South Africa. And I believed that for a long time, and there wasn't space for more. Uh, but now, when I see how overburdened they are, how impossible it is for them to just keep up, because you, you have to bear in mind that the NPA is not only prosecuting state capture. They're not only prosecuting uh, apartheid-era crimes. They're not only doing um, the top-level organizations. They do everything from uh, shoplifting to housebreaking to house robberies mm -hmm. to motor car theft to hijacking. Uh, rape, murder, assault, everything, thousands of crimes a day get committed in South Africa, sadly. And they have to prosecute all of them. And those wheels have to turn as well. So it's not like they can shift that aside, not deal with it and just deal with these cherry-picked cases. So they really, really are overburdened. And they have a serious paucity of, uh, of experienced prosecutors. So, so it's difficult for them. And now seeing how they struggle to, to deal with state capture and talking to prosecutors every day and hearing about their difficulties and also their fears because, you know, it's been a long time since a big case was prosecuted in South Africa. And, and half of winning your case is, is, is your confidence. You, you can't walk into court afraid. You've got to walk into court believing, A, in your case, but more importantly, believing in yourself. And I don't think they do anymore. I think, the, I think what paralyzes the NPA at the moment is fear of failure. And, and so I became convinced that they needed help. And the only way to deal with it would then be to put something, to construct a body like the Anti-Corruption Commission, which would be a Chapter 9 institution, and I'll tell you why it should be a Chapter 9 institution, um, so that it could take over the role that the, the DSO or the, you know, the Scorpions uh, used to do. So serious um, corruption, serious, very high level, uh, small amount of commercial crime and organized crime. And they did it very effectively. They did it so effectively that the ANC became disenchanted with them and dissolved them. So so why do you think you will have the support of ANC now well, to get that bill through Parliament? Well, we have now a, a different um, approach really to corruption in South Africa. Uh, it's become so endemic that, that everyone is unhappy. Uh, the citizens, all the citizenry are unhappy about it. Um, and there is some small, uh, very small, a glimmer of a desire to deal with, with crime. So if it is a Chapter 9 institution, it means that it can't be dissolved overnight with 51% majority in Parliament. You need 75%. And the ANC will never smell 75% in Parliament again in this life or the next one. So... So it would it would make it uh, safe. It would safe from that kind of an attack, um, and it would then lighten the burden of the NPA only mm. to do very high level corruption, state capture, very high level corruption, organised crime, and leave the NPA to do everything else. And it should always mm. be done in in uh, you know in discussion with the national director of public prosecution. It should never be so that it can just. Uh, ignore the NPA. It should always be done uh, with some sort of, you know, discussion. So, so I think we would get support for it because 
how would it look? I mean, just can you imagine sitting in Parliament and voting on this bill to set up a body that can that can and will address corruption in South Africa? We'll put a lid on it. We'll see to it that people go to jail. We'll see to it that the the the, uh, the main accused in all the state capture cases land up in prison where they belong, and the ANC votes against it. I mean, how? But how soon can one expect that commission to be established, providing the bill sails through Parliament of support? Well, let's let's assume the bill should be tabled in this this, this the, the sixth Parliament. So before. Parliament rises next year. One hopes that this bill will go through. Um, the commission can be set up uh, within the space of uh, around a year, I would say. Um, you know, it needs to be well funded. It needs to be well resourced. But there are uh, there's so much skill in this country that's not in the NPA that is available. So if everything goes according to plan, how soon can can that body start prosecuting? With the cooperation of the National Prosecuting Authority, I'd say within eighteen months. I think that's doable. Now, what triggers you to fight for justice the way you do? Well, um, did you just wake up one morning and decide <laughs> I'm going to be a prosecutor and I'm no, going to go after all. the I'm bad guys? Became, like I became a politician by default, I became <laughs> a, a prosecutor by default. Tell us about um, you. I studied law at the University of the Free State. Um, the LRB course was offered only part-time at night, so everybody did their articles during the day. Um, I did that, and, and I, after doing that, I knew that I didn't want to be an attorney. Didn't like it at all. Um, and then a, as I finished my LLB, uh, there was a huge shortage of prosecutors in, in, the, in the then Department of Justice, and I got offered a job in Johannesburg, and it was, you know, as, a, as an article clerk in Bloemfontein, you earned uh, 300 rand a month. Uh, this was more than four times my salary, and I said, absolutely, here I go. And uh, after the first day, I knew that this was exactly the job that I wanted to do. I loved it from day one, uh, and I still think it's the best job in the world, uh, as long as you can do it honestly. So so I loved being a prosecutor. Um, but it wasn't something that I planned. It was, you know, it, was, it came along fortuitously. Yeah. And you've kept going regardless? I detest bullies. I really do. I <laughs> detest bullies. Um I, I always fight for the underdog. I always support the underdog. I really, you know, I have a firm belief that not everybody can fight. Not all of us are fighters, and that's fine. Uh, but those of us who are must. And sadly, I, you know, I didn't get the flight gene. I only got the fight. <laughs> no, there was an epic exchange between you and the minister of police in Parliament that went perfectly vi viral. Yeah. How do you two get on? Do you go to lunch? No, no, we don't go to lunch. <laughs> But uh, but we get along fine. It's not it's not personal, you know. It's a it's a job. I hold him to account uh, in an oversight position. Uh, the type of better thing, in my view, was uh, an absolute debacle. And I still Please. hold the view that if if Ground Up hadn't published the facts that they fact that they that they published, uh, we would still not have known that he had escaped. They were never going to tell anyone in South Africa that he escaped. They were never going to look for him. He was going to carry on living in Hyde Park, living the best life, shopping at Thrupps. And and uh, and they had conspired to not do anything about it because they'd known for almost a year by the time it ground up published, and they had done nothing. No investigation had been started. They had done nothing, and they knew that the body in the cell was not his. So there's no reason to believe they were going to do anything, and and I, I believe that because of that, just that little scenario, uh, the minister of justice and the minister of police should have resigned. Mm. if they had any ounce of integrity. And when they didn't resign, uh, the president, bless him, should have fired them. But, of course, uh, that also won't happen because that would require him to do something. Why um, ha has President Cyril Ramaphosa not fired the Minister of Justice? No, the Lord alone knows. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, Cyril Ramaphosa hasn't done a, a hell of a lot. Um, Do you know where he is? Well, who knows where he is? Do you know where he is? I mean, have <laughs> you seen him? No, I'm asking you. No, the last time, <laughs> the last time I saw him uh, in a remotely identifiable spot was when he was sitting in the carriage in London, waving out the window, um, on his way to the crowning of, I think it was the king. Um, that's the last time I saw him in any place that one could identify where he was. Yeah. Some last words, please, Glennis, for those who feel that justice has not only been deferred and delayed, but denied. Oi, that's terrible. That's such an indictment. 
uh, yeah, justice hasn't. There's hope. There's absolute hope. Uh, I always believe that there's hope. Um, the NPA is improving, not sufficiently quickly for my liking. I understand the difficulties. I would like to have seen more. Um, this parliament is coming to an end. You know, we're having an election in May. Uh, it remains to be seen who will be re-elected. I may not be re-elected, and then I'll go and find something else to do. Uh, but if I am re-elected, then then absolutely this uh, these bills will be pushed and and these institutions will be and established. And and not only me, there are there are many people in South Africa who fight for justice uh, every single day, and a lot of them are in the NPA. A lot of them are in the police. There are really good people in those institutions. The the, the institutions themselves have been allowed to. Uh, to languish and, and they need a, a kick start. Yeah. Thank you. Bernice Breitenbach speaking to Biz News in the Cape Town studios at the Latitude Hotel. There you go. <laughs>